All right, now we're recording. Okay, if you go to my website, I'd rather be writing.com, click API doc, you'll see on the left, uh, under introduction to, a to REST APIs, there's a course slides link and a workshop activities link. Those are the two parts that I'll refer to, and this is the breakdown of what we'll go through today. We've got part six parts. Intro to API documentation, where we'll kind of warm you up to what REST APIs are all about and why the field is so exciting and, and uh, the opportunities. We'll jump into how to use an API like a developer. So you kind of put on a developer hat and use a, a weather API to make some requests and get some responses, do something with them. Uh, then in part three, we'll jump into documenting API endpoints, the reference component of API docs and how you document them, what you should look for. Uh, we'll look at you know, the, documenting the resource URL, the, the sample request, sample response, the endpoint definition, and so forth. Then we'll jump into Open API and Swagger. This tends to be the most popular section. This is a formal specification for describing APIs. Um, and a way to generate interactive documentation that allows people to try it out. Then we'll jump into publishing API docs. Uh, we'll look at some docs as code workflows, why publishing is important, how writers sometimes collaborate with engineers in this space. And finally, getting a job in API documentation, which might be more relevant to some than others, but. Uh, I find that there's kind of several categories of people who take this course. The, the most common are people who uh, have an upcoming API project at work, something they're anticipating, and so they're, they're trying to ramp up. Another category are people who are trying to transition from their current field, whatever it is, or role, into something related to API docs. And then often uh, there might be other, other types of people, students, academics, uh, people returning to the workforce, whatever. Um, so these are the six categories here. Uh, we'll probably spend about an hour on each one. The breakdown of today is that we'll go until noon. Uh, that will be lunch. It will be here. Um, and then the end of the day, uh, our, our final kind of exit time is five, but we might end a little earlier because I think we have to be clearly out of here. And all day long, um, doing API docs can be a little tedious, but I've given this workshop a number of times and each time I try to improve it, so I have learned from mistakes in the past. Um, I have got a lot more activities, uh, or actually I have a couple of new activities that I've never done, I'm kind of excited to try them out. And uh, I want this to be very interactive. I mean, you come to a workshop, you want to get uh, questions answered, you want personal uh, help or, or direction, and I'm here to provide that as well. So at any time you have questions, just raise your hand or jump in. Uh, there's no like need to wait until later, or, or if you have things you want to talk about, I'd be happy to steer it in that direction. Any, any initial thoughts or questions before we Keep going, does it sound good? Is it what you guys signed up for? You're like, this is what I'm here for? How many of you guys are already documenting uh, APIs of some kind? Five, six, okay. How many of you guys uh, took this course because you have an upcoming API project at your work and you're trying to ramp up? Just three? How many of you are trying to transition from whatever tech com role you have now and more API doc? Just one, just one person, okay. <laughs> How many of you are uh, um, like academics? <laughs> okay. How about? Sorry, I've got a long yet. <laughs> How many of you are, are students? Okay, no, no students. Wow, come to a town with three colleges and zero students. Are there no tech comm programs in this area? There are two. Two. Okay. Besides the East Carolina one where you teach at. No, there's including that. Including that, okay. What's the other one? NC State. Well, actually three. Where we are. Yeah. Right. NC yeah. State. Is yeah. Part of. Yeah. Okay. McKibben said it's part of NC State. So is is anybody who teaches at NC State's TechCom program um, like here? No. Oh, okay. All right. 
M my hope is that one day, like API documentation will be an offering in in many kind of curriculum they curriculums. Just can't do that instructions. <laughs> it's a little bit of time Yeah. Well, we'll see. Um, Uh, you know, I transitioned into this space about six years ago. Um, I was working in a company in Utah. I was doing normal type of documentation for uh, non-developer people. And one day, one day they just laid off the whole tech writing team. They said, we're going to outsource this, this service, you know, goodbye. And they said, here's a nice severance check. Go make your way somewhere else. And I was like, wow, this... This is totally une unexpected. Um, but I took the severance money and said, I'm going to go to the mecca of tech. I'm going to go to Silicon Valley. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like, integrate myself there. And as I got into Silicon Valley and, and the companies there, I realized that the hottest space to be in, the most stable, lucrative, interesting, and kind of fast moving space is developer documentation, writing for people who develop software, really. Um, of course, it, the industries vary all over the world. If you're in Germany, it's a totally different scene. If you're in the East Coast, it's probably a lot different as well. But in the Bay Area, developer documentation is where it's at. Um, and within this large umbrella of developer docs are many different topics. Um, APIs, an even larger topic here, you know, is, is a huge component of them. But even in APIs, there are lots of different types of APIs. There's the, the traditional Java API or C++ API. Other types of code that people download to their, their computers and, and they integrate into their projects and compile and release and so forth. Um, but probably the most accessible and um, interesting and, and popular type of API is, is the REST API. And this is one that doesn't actually require uh, a lot of programming knowledge to jump into. So uh, it tends to be more feasible for technical writers to play a stronger role in creating documentation for. Uh, but it is also, um, there's a lot, I mean, uh, there's a lot of technical aspects to it. All right, let me jump into this here. Uh, <clears throat> and let's see. This is a slide from programmable web. By the way, <laughs> as I note some of this stuff, I have, a, I have an activity at the end that's kind of like a, a Jeopardy game. So, you know, as you take note of things, uh, hopefully at the end you'll, you'll rock that game. Uh, but <laughs> just kind of keep that in the back of your mind just to capture things. But this, this site, Programmable Web, is a site that tracks open APIs uh, on the web mostly REST APIs. And this uh, chart here shows their progress. If you look back at January 2005 or six, it was just taking off, right? This is a 10-year-old industry, really, um, in terms of the, the REST APIs. APIs themselves go back much farther. But what was happening in around 2005? <clears throat> well, eBay, uh, or some people with eBay seller accounts wanted to programmatically uh, update lots of different seller accounts uh, for, for their, their stores. And can you imagine logging into an interface with 20 different stores or so and having to make all these updates? It would be very tedious. So uh, this was kind of the first uh, genre where they started to um, programmatically update things from a distance using an API to control and update lots of these eBay accounts. And the growth now is, it only lists around 20,000, but these are the open uh, APIs, meaning ones that are on the web that are, aren't behind firewalls that you can point uh, links to and describe. If you were to categorize and classify all the private APIs, the ones behind companies, the ones internal to companies, uh, it would be much, much larger. Um, all right, so why are APIs taking off so much? Well, the reason is that unlike other products in the developer space, really the documentation tends to be the interface. Uh, in a survey where they asked people and they, they said, 
uh, what are the most important factors that are that you that you feel are, are <clears throat> important factors in God, now that I look at this, I don't even know what the important factors were. were of. Important factors to developers related to APIs. Um, they ranked complete and accurate documentation as the very most important one. Um, why is that? It's because in order to understand how to use the API, there's not a GUI that you can explore. There's not uh, some other thing you download. The documentation is how people interface with the product to understand how it works and, and use it more or less. Um, and so companies know that you know, docs play this huge role in selling their product and portraying their company. It's what developers will browse and they'll say, you know, what is this API all about? And if, they, if the documentation looks poor, incomplete, uh, unprofessional, you know, how is the product going to take off? It's, it's, it's not really. Um, the, AP, the web itself is also becoming more of a, a mashup of API services. So these API, APIs are taking off because that's just sort of how the web is evolving. It, you no longer have these standalone services where you have entirely self-contained uh, from beginning to end um, packages of things. Instead, you have lots of different services that people pull together into these, these mashups depending on, upon what they need. For example, say you're building a website. Um, maybe 15 years ago, you would download uh, a CMS that would give you everything out of the box, your newsletter, your payment, your, your forms, your, uh, all the features you want. But now, it's much more bare bones and you pull in the services that you want. You want a newsletter? Well, you pull in a, a web or MailChimp. You want a uh, uh, commenting feature? You pull in Discuss. You want videos? You pull in YouTube. You want uh, payment? You use Stripe. You want search? You use Algolia. And all these different services from all over the web are communicating with your site through APIs. You know, you, it's not something that you see um, it's not something that people go in and actively execute. It's all behind the scenes plumbing. Um, the job market is also very hot. I alluded to this earlier, but if this is a sample job posting uh, for a API tech writer in Palo Alto, and you can see that um, they say the client wants to find someone who will emulate Dropbox's developer documentation. So you've got these examples of these really hot looking doc sites by these companies and, and they've sort of upped the bar. They've made it so that they're the, the thing that we emulate. A lot of people like to put Stripe on that same category and say, well, you know, Stripe looks awesome. You make our docs look like that. So if you have those skills, it is huge. Um, we'll talk, talk more about the job market towards the end, but uh, this is also a, a cool part of it. And, and really, like, there's a, there's a shortage of uh, workers available, at least in Silicon Valley, for these jobs. We, you can spend months looking for somebody. Let me back up a little bit and just talk about what APIs are. Right? An API stands for an Application Programming Interface. And if you think about it like a cog that connects two different systems, that's really what it is. Um, the API would be this little cog in the middle. On the left, you've got system A doing something. On the right, system B. They need some way to interact, and the API is that little connection point. It allows two computers to interact with each other in a programmatic way. Um, and how, how, how exactly are REST APIs different from previous APIs? Well, does anybody know what was the most common web API prior to REST? Soap, yeah, and soap, soap, um, service-oriented architecture protocol. I'm not even sure what it stands for, but uh, it it was XML-based and it was much more exacting about the exact type of information that was going out. And when it was received, there was a kind of a, <clears throat> a specific um, way of validating that it followed the right format before it was incorporated. Uh, they used these WSDL files in order to define exactly what, what the API's capabilities were. It was very, very exact and precise. 
Well, REST is much more flexible. It's more of an architectural style um, instead of an exact protocol. There, there are common properties, uh, like it uses HTTP as the transport protocol uh, and, and other kinds of common properties. But in order to really understand how the thing works, you need uh, documentation because of this variation. Without, without documentation, um, it, people are, are going to be in the dark, unlike with SOAP. It's also much lighter weight. Uh, the responses are often in JSON. Um, and it's, it's mostly replaced SOAP, but SOAP is still used, especially in like financial banking sort of transactions or other type of enterprise uh, scenarios. So, <clears throat> but both of them are, are classified as web APIs because they transmit over the web. As a, as a metaphor, think of it like this. Uh, you have a calculator on your computer, right? When you press numbers, eight plus nine, and you hit you know, enter, what's happening? Well, when you hit buttons on any interface, behind the scenes, what's happening is calls are being made out to some service, information is being retrieved and pulled back. Now, with the case of your calculator, all this happens locally, but with web APIs, it's happening remotely. You go to an interface, you hit create something, uh, and a little call on the back end says go out and do some operation on a server and it hits a response and then it shows it back to you. So it looks like it's all happening in front and you, on your local machine, but really there are all these calls that go out. That's why when the internet goes off, right, a lot of things stop working because they need that, that wiring through the internet to get all this information. And that wiring is, is basically APIs that are doing the plumbing. Um, at the heart of APIs is this, this model of requests and responses. If, if you, you know, get nothing else out of this course, it's just, this is basically what it boils down to, is what can I ask for and what do I get back? And the requests typically take this uh, pattern or shape where you have a, a, a website URL. I mean, it looks very similar to what you type in to go to any website online. Um, you have, that's called a resource URL, that makes the request and you can execute it from any application. You could be in Ruby, you can be in Java, you can be in C++, it doesn't matter. They're language agnostic because they all transmit across HTTP, Hypertext Transport Protocol. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the highway on the web, what allows information to travel. Um, it goes out to some server, and the server could be in anything. It could be in Java, it could be in Python, whatever your web server is coded in doesn't really matter because the request is coming in HTTP uh, and then the server does whatever it does, executes the logic, and then it packages back the response in usually JSON, could be XML, but something that looks like this, sends it back down to the application and then the application has to do something with that response. So uh, essentially developers want to know how do I make the different requests and what comes back in the response? And because it all happens through HTTP, that means the bulk of what you document isn't necessarily the programming language, but rather the heart of what the requests and the responses are. Uh, the web follows REST as well. If you go to a site like I'd rather be writing.com, <clears throat> you type that in the browser, you go into Chrome, you're basically executing a GET request to this server. This goes out to the server, Bluehost, wherever I have my stuff. Uh, the server receives the information and says, oh, wants to get whatever's at this, this space, sends it back. In this case, it sends it back as HTML. And all that Chrome and Firefox and so forth do is make that response readable. They take and pretty it up. They show you, they, they show you only what you want. There's a lot of other information that comes back. but. Uh, yeah, at the heart of it, the web is, is basically a big REST API. Okay, so that is kind of a short introduction to, uh, uh, to REST APIs. And now I have a short activity here. You'll see on this activities page that I've got all the activities sort of consolidated here. So um, it's a way of making it easy to get to them. But this first one is a very simple activity. It's a group activity. 
I, I want you to identify your goals with API documentation. I want to understand, you know, why are you taking this course? What are your career ambitions related to this? Um, and so forth. Uh, so, and this is also an activity to try to get us talking a little bit more interactive. Uh, so, I'm just going to ask these questions and whoever wants to respond, just raise your hand and, and share. But, um, why are you taking this course on API documentation? Yes. Okay. And for me, I think this will give me an edge up on my next possible step in my career. Okay. I've been a technical writer for 13 years. I write, I edit, I code some. I think this could be another avenue. All right, great. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Anybody else? Uh, so I raised my hand earlier to indicate that I am um, currently back to the USD API, but like right now, I feel like a glorified secretary for engineering and. Uh, I'd like to understand it a little better. So. Yeah, so how do you go to that next level and, and not be just a, a, an engineering secretary, right? Mm -hmm. More of a power player and influencer. Uh, what, are your, what are your career ambitions related to API docs? Are you looking to become, uh, you know, is this going to be part of like how you brand and sell yourself? Or is this just something uh, you're just exploring? Anybody have any larger ambitions about career paths? Yes. I'm just, I would like to get back into API documentation. I, I did document COM APIs back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and, and have done some developer, general developer documentation. But I'd like to, to me, that has been the most challenging, exciting, is to work on the API documentation. Cool, cool. Um, are you in a place where developer doc jobs are plentiful? Is, this, is Raleigh a good place? Mm -hmm. Somebody's shaking their head back there, like, no way. I think it is. I mean, I think it is. There's no silicon valley, but. Yeah. It's what? It's not silicon valley, oh. obviously. But I think it, for API uh, jobs, there are also a lot of remote opportunities that yeah. are available. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, if you've got like good, good skills at this and, and you can tackle a technical topic, people will definitely jump on a remote opportunity for somebody who's qualified. Um, yeah, all right, but you're shaking your head back there. You disagree. Well, remote. <coughs> remote? Yeah. Okay. In this area, it feels to me like it's a little more rounded. API docs might be a part of what you do, but not necessarily. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I think that's uh, a direction a lot of companies are headed where tech writers play lots of different roles. You might write API docs and also UX copy and regular documentation for non-developers and uh, I don't know, other kinds of analytical reports. You know, it's you know, one component. I've seen the opposite of that happen. Yeah? Getting more specialized? Yeah. You know, I've been a technical writer for a long time and wore a lot of hats and then the last company I worked for they were getting more specialized. They hired UX designers. They had um, business analysts, and and my what I was doing was getting smaller and smaller and smaller compared to what I'd been doing in the past. Were you a was it a startup or was it a no, big it company? A, it was a very well established, hmm. large company, and it, and it had been growing. Yeah. And mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, I think the degree of of how many hats you wear can often depend on the type of company, right? Startup, you might do support as well as product management. Who knows? Uh, E-learning. But uh, yeah, the larger companies specialize more, and a lot of times that can be more efficient. At, at our, uh, in my current role, my colleague says, uh, whenever somebody requests non-developer documentation, like for people who support a business or something, he's like, that's not our job. <laughs> I'm like, really? OK. <laughs> I'm not sure where that's written. but. <laughs> He'll turn it down. Um, so, do you have the technical? Oh, actually, I missed a question. What would you consider to be a success metric? That's business jargon, but how would you measure whether taking this course is going to uh, be successful for you? Yes, Christina. Uh, considering we are mostly documentarians, I think being able to publish something today would be a good metric. Hmm. To publish something that's like API yeah. doc related. Yeah. Okay. 
Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I've come in today not knowing a lot about API, but then when I go back, I need to okay. understand a uh, little bit more than what I had understood in the past. Yeah, okay, so increased understanding. Anybody else? In the red? Um, well, I think it would be great to be able to um, stand in an interview and say, yes, I am confident that I can learn, understand, and do this job. Yeah. Okay, so being able to actually have a lot more credibility and, and some kind of even portfolio in an interview. All right, uh, you? I was just going to say, um, learn more, more specifically about REST API. Because I have worked with APIs in the past, but not specifically REST. Okay, so just like more on the REST API side rather than just APIs in general. All right, last question. Do you have the technical mindset needed to excel in developer documentation fields? This is, a, this is a tough question, but really it's at the heart of it because, I mean, there's so much you just have to learn um, and just be willing to uh, kind of sink in, in 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 this field. But what do you think? Does this intimidate you that you're like, oh, developers, it's hard to write for, or no, this is, you know, exciting? Any thoughts? All right, well, it's definitely... Um, I think if we're here on yeah. Yeah, that's right. Shows dedication. I tried to get Giuseppe to schedule this on a Friday, but he said you wouldn't come on a Friday. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I do want to work in periodic breaks, but it still feels pretty early. So maybe we'll skip the break right now and uh, we'll jump into the second section. Um, but that was just sort of a warm up. Now we're going to get a lot more hands-on, and my philosophy is that in order to kind of understand APIs, you sort of just need to use them a little bit, even if it's somewhat unfamiliar, and as you use them, you'll kind of, things will sink in. So in this section, you're going to pretend you're not, you're not going to be a technical writer right now. You're a developer, and you're going to go through some very basic general sort of workflows. Then after this, you'll put the tech writer hat back on, and then you'll have a better grounding for what developers are looking for. All right, sound okay? And this is this one, as I said, has some more fun hands-on activities. Here is the scenario. You're building a website, and guess what? You're targeting bicycle cyclists who want to know the weather conditions, especially how windy it is outside. Does anybody bike to work? Is anybody a bicycle commuter? Two people, awesome, so am I. And uh, yeah, the wind is huge, right? If you have a 29 mile per hour headwind, that is gonna be really, <laughs> really, that's almost impossible. But, uh, but if it's a tailwind, that would be a lot of fun. Um, so in order to build this little widget, uh, and we won't build the entire widget, but we'll, we'll sort of get the sense of how it would, would work. Uh, we need to gather information from a weather service, right? We don't, we don't know. Like, I don't know how, what the weather is like outside, obviously. Uh, I couldn't tell you the exact temperature and the wind and so forth. So the first step will be to figure out how to uh, pull this in. And in the end, this little widget will basically just get the, the, the information. So if you look here, uh, if you click check wind, it goes and gets the, the the information. This actually is in Santa Clara. Uh, and yeah, it's about what it is here, I would say. I don't know, calm day, clouds, 54 degrees. 55 here. Okay, so yeah. Oh, somebody already built the widget. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now, you could make a much more fancy implementation, for example, if you wanted to. This is like a Yahoo weather map or something where You've got uh, picture images of weather. That can also be something you pull in. But you could take and create an attractive UI. But at the heart of it, it's the same thing. You're going out and you're getting calls and you're put, putting them on the page somewhere. Whether you have a, a droplet that kind of fills up and so forth to show how much precipitation there is or not, sort of beyond what, what we would need to cover. Um, how do you choose a weather API? This is actually a huge kind of consideration. Uh, and I have selected this API called Open Weather Map. 
there are lots of weather APIs, and in the past I've chosen a different one that was a lot like smaller and simpler, and then it and then it would crash all the time. So, and the bigger ones they're like way too robust and complex, and you need like uh, paid keys and so forth to to use them. So, this one I don't really know where these people are based, but there's it, it seems like a very stable sort of service. Um, they seem to have like. 20 or 30 people at their company and they specialize in weather and uh, it seems to work. But that's the first step. So now we're gonna jump into some activities. Go ahead and go to this um, workshop activities page right here where it says workshop activities right under, you know, if you, if you get lost here, go to idratherbewriting.com, click API doc in the first section or as a workshop activities. I should probably make this like a larger button somewhere, <clears throat> but uh, currently not. We are going to do activity 2A. All right, so expand this. And <clears throat> I hope you all can go online and everything. If you, if you have trouble, raise your hand and I'll go around. But uh, <clears throat> we can just do this one together as well. Go to openweathermap.com and you can see that kind of they have um, multiple services. One of them is API. Click API in the top. We're going to get a sense of what kind of data is available through this. Um, so I've got a number of questions here. Does the API provide the information we need for our scenario? Remember, we're trying to get the temperature and the wind specifically the wind, really, uh, in our current area. So if you're looking through here, um, these, are, these are actually the different sort of endpoints or different resources available. Current weather, hourly forecast, 16-day forecast, five-day forecast, historical data, history bulk. There's even relief maps. Weather 2.0, there's a lot of stuff here actually. A lot of it in beta, which is cool. It shows they're active. So uh, does, this, does this API have what we need? I mean, what we need is pretty basic. Come into current weather, scroll down here. Does it have information about the temperature and, and wind? Yeah, you can see here in API response, it does say that it's got the wind. Uh, it even tells you the direction, right? We wanted that as well, the degrees. Although, you know, we might look at this and say, I'm gonna have to convert this into like a cardinal direction, north, west, south, east. And 7.31, it's really not clear if that's knots or miles or kilometers, but it's there. Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways that you could get this. By zip code, you specify the location through geographic coordinates, uh, by city ID. Actually, if you download this, there's a CSV file somewhere that tells you all the, yeah, the city IDs and it's immense, um, and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, this, this has the information we need. How many different ways can you specify this location? We looked at that. Now, what does a sample request look like? Um, here, they've, this is, this is actually something about their API that I, I don't really like, but uh, let's say that we want to call it by city name. It shows you sample requests here. You can see they, they've just got examples, and if you click them, open that in a new browser, you can see the sample response. Now I have a JSON um, extension that's going to, uh, let me close that box, a JSON extension that will format this. You might see it minimized. But what I don't really like about their API is that this is not dynamic. This is just a, a like, they uploaded JSON there and put it for London. If you were to change this to like Raleigh, uh, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna actually change to Raleigh. It still says London down here. so. I emailed them about this, but they're like, no, that's just how it works. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it's kind of hard to support a dynamic thing because then if it goes down or if things change, it's like it could suddenly not work. But you can, I mean, right away you get a sense of this is a request and that's the response. So you've got a, a very clear pairing of that. Uh, and in this response, yeah, I've got the wind speed and, and other types of information that I could then integrate into my site. One other question we'll, we'll want to know is how do you authorize this, right? How, how do you authorize it? Is it free? Does it cost money? How many times can I authorize it? So where can you find information about how you authorize the requests. This is actually a topic we'll return to later. In the programmer's guide. <laughs> In the how to start document. I actually, oh yeah, read how to start first. All right, so yeah, three simple steps. This is a common pattern in, in, in docs is like, hey, Here's how you get started, and we're going to try to make it seem very simple for you. You sign up for an API key, which they're going to call an app ID intuitively, right, instead of key. <laughs> Start using the API for free. And then if you need other features, uh, subscribe to their stuff. Well, how much does it cost? If I go to price, they do say free, but you can see it's also tiered, right? And this is sort of the model on the web. Thing, things at the lowest tier are free. So you can try them, and then if you find that it works and you like it, and then they start charging you. It's kind of just how everything works. But at free, with a free model, you can do 60 calls per minute, which is perfect for this workshop, because if you're making more than 60 calls per minute, it's going to be quite impressive. Uh, <laughs> but if you, if you uh, like at a website where you have traffic, you could say, well, I get, you know, 5,000 visitors a day, will this be enough? And figure out what kind of package you would need. All right, so um, yeah, this is a great one. And the next activity, we want to get the authorization keys. Uh, hopefully, you've already got these. But if not, uh, this is how you get them. You know, you've, this is activity 2B. You get them, you've, you sign, sign, in, sign up, sign in, either way. I'm already signed in. Uh, once you're signed in, you should see this little dashboard here. Click API keys and copy your key here. Whoops. All right, and put it in some place where you'll, you'll find it. I'll give you a second to do that. Um, now, if you're just signing up for an API key, they will often say that it might take an hour to activate. So if that's the case, it might not work immediately, and I'll give you a different one you could use. But All right, uh, need more time on this one? Is it, does everybody already, everybody already raised their hand earlier to say they've signed up for API keys. So uh, if you're still working through that, just try to do that. OK, now we're going to talk about submitting requests. Probably the best tool and the most popular one for submitting requests is a tool called Postman. Um, this is now an app. It used to be a browser extension or an app. Now it's just an app. But uh, if you haven't downloaded this, download it because um, uh, we're going to make some calls here. Um, basically, this is a, a, a GUI that lets you configure a bunch of stuff about how you're going to make the calls. Um, it, it provides a place to put the request, to enter your parameters, your authorization information. And most importantly, it allows you to save all of, all of your requests and the responses on the left, which is probably uh, what makes it so popular, right? Um, you can also generate out snippets of code. Uh, like if you want to make the request using JavaScript or Java or some other language in curl, and so forth. You've got a handy little widget there. You can e even generate out documentation from this. A lot of people use, um, a lot of developers use Postman as they're, as they're developing. Uh, and they, they, you can sync, like I could sync all of my requests uh, and the responses with a whole team and so forth. Hmm. 
cool, cool. Does anybody else use Postman at their work? How many, for how many of you is Postman brand new? Oh, like most of the people, okay. Okay, you use them for testing. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people do because you you can save them. You can have like a million different versions. Another popular way to test um, calls is through curl, which we'll get into next. But this is, I think, uh, it's not only easier. It seems a little more useful. Uh, curl curl is often used in a more programmatic way when the people test things. All right, so we are going to do. Activity 2C, you're going to make a request with Postman. Uh, if you're coming here, make requests with Postman. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the basic endpoint for, for this weather that we're looking at is shown here in step four. Or if you're in the docs, you come in here to API, click current weather, if you click API doc, uh, it shows you the sample API call here as well. Take and plug this into the get box in Postman. Just paste it right there. And then we need to add two parameters. We need to add the app ID and uh, the location, right? So, or actually three, the units as well. So, um, if you copy, you, you probably maybe have your API key still copied, and they call this app ID. So, if you expand, the, if you click the params button below, right below key, just type the word app ID, hit tab, and paste in your API key. You'll see that it appends this parameter after a question mark in the get box. That's called a query string parameter. Everything after the question mark is a query string parameter. We have two other parameters. We have, let's just look up our location by zip code. It tends to be easiest. What's the zip code in Raleigh? Does anybody know where we're? 27613. Okay, 27613. And then so that we get, um, Units that are a little more understandable, if you type units, I believe that's it, yeah, units, and then imperial. It's just kind of weird to type instead of metric. Uh, that, that also gets appended here as a query string parameter. I'll talk more about query string parameters later, but you can see that they're concatenated with an ampersand and their order really doesn't matter. Uh, now, if we had other parameters, like a, a request body parameter, you could click the body tab here and add it. If we had a header parameter, this is a parameter that's submitted in the header rather than the, the request URL. You could add it here, but this API doesn't have those type of parameters, at least not for this call. They're all just, uh, regular query string parameters that you configure under params. Once you do that, click send, and the response appears in the body area below. You see pretty raw. Raw is just gonna be the unminified compressed version. Pretty is white spaced um, or, or formatted in a readable way. <clears throat> and you can see down here, The name is Carrie. Is that where we currently are? Yeah. Okay. Close. <laughs> <laughs> so this is <coughs> this is a successful response. Tell me if you raise your hand if you're able to get a successful response. I have a question. Yes. Of the key, where did that come from? Is that the key that we generated? Yeah, that's what you, that's the API key that you got. Where's the API key I lost? <coughs> If you click, um, you come into the open weather map and sign in, you see a little dashboard of tabs. It's, it's under API keys, which is a little inconsistent in their name because this is actually the app ID. I don't see. Are you signed in to open weather map? Uh, let me sign in. Okay. I am signed in. Okay. 
Oh, now I see the API. OK. Yes? OK. All right. So in Postman, you should, you should see a box there in the middle. All right, let me, let me take a look. All right. Let me see what I can see over there. Let's see, do you have the postman? Oh, okay. I don't know what I'm doing what, here. <laughs> uh, if you click new, what happens? New request. Okay. And then what do I do? Um, I don't know, maybe you just call it a name. Uh, okay. Actually, oh, it's trying to give you a tutorial. Uh, hit end lesson. It's kind of odd. Frustrating. It won't let me. There we go. I don't know why it's asking you to save this, but I don't know either. <laughs> Do I and just then click, save? click, on, click a collection, and now they'll save. Oh great! Oh okay. Now you should. Right. This is the, the box to key. enter it in. Yeah, um, you got to put the URL first. Okay. To, um, go to uh, it's that long one, api.openweathermap.org, and so forth. If you uh, let's see. If you expand, there you go. You, you can expand the workshop ones or there. You can just go scroll down a little bit and copy copy that. Uh, copy copy uh, actually the, the zip this? one. The zip is there a zip code one? Let's scroll down more. Right here. Um, yeah, sure that'll work. Or, you know, they it doesn't. It's not it's very not copyable. Copy. So it's easier if you go back to the the, the course site oh. and find the uh, scroll up a little bit. No, no, yeah, let's see, um, make requests with Postman, just copy, copy that, it's easier. Okay, thanks, this is... Oops, and, and, and watch out for that period there. That's... Yeah, deal with all these browsers. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you got a lot of stuff open, but well, yeah, I tried to open it all to get ready. And this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. You can. There you go. Okay. So in the in the left on the left, or actually just on the on the very left. Um, well, yeah. I mean, sorry. In this box, go ahead and delete the key so it doesn't get in your way. Okay. Now, now under keys, type app ID. All lowercase, all lowercase on one word. And then put the value of your API key right there. No, oh, okay. Um, Actually, in the next one up. Sorry. Okay. And then, and then a zip, and a, choose a zip, and then you should be able to hit that. Anybody else need help? Anybody else have a glitch issue? Technical? Okay. I can't figure out how to see how to get this box. Oh, you got a successful response, right? Well, I don't know. I can't. I'm oh, to, this right there? You can't scroll I down? I can't scroll. Uh, what does hmm. that do? That looks like it's copying it to your clipboard. Well, that would work. Um, I was trying to get this what about light. this larger scroll bar on the right? You've got two scroll bars. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Two scroll bars. A design. That's right. It's a design thing, to, a bad design to have multiple scroll bars. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, have, I have to go into the Apple store and it's not allowing me to create my, my little Apple ID. Oh, oh, it's not necessarily Apple ID. This is just your the, the app ID for, for this open weather map. Well, let me back up. Oh. It's for being able to download one of these. Um, oh, I see. These, these apps and it's not allowing it because it's not recognized as a legitimate app and you have to go to the Apple. Apple Pay oh. Do that. oh, I see. Is um, but you've got it downloaded. Uh, you've got Postman right there. I, I, do, I do, but it was. I'm just trying to see if this other one is, is necessary. Let me show you. Um, oh, for other stuff, yeah. you've got yeah, Git. Do I have? It's <clears throat> downloaded, but it won't allow. Uh, okay. you know what? It's built into the Mac, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, cool. So yeah, but yeah, I, I forgot about security stuff that can often be a. Anybody else? Did it work? <laughs> Still not working? Let me see. App ID, zip, units. Send. No, yeah, you've got it down here. Oh, API key button. failure. I don't 
see a huh. send button. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on. It doesn't like your API key. Okay. Because see, it says invalid API uh, key. I put a zip code in there. Maybe oh. that's why. <laughs> yeah. Hit send again to get. Uh, where is, where'd I, send I, go? There's no button. That's the problem. I, it just. I, I, um, I, what browser should I be using? Oh, it's a downloadable thing. Just click in there and then hit return. See if that does it. Uh, or save example. Wait. It's my stupid browser, I think. Huh. I don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure. Let yeah, me see. It's weird. Uh, it's the browser, I think. Well, uh, that is kind of odd. Yeah. But if you want it, why don't you just copy this whole thing, paste it in a new tab, and see if it if that works. Just copy that, copy that string. Just that, just that part. Oh, I the see. The whole thing. Now you've got the send button again. Oh, okay. All right. There okay, you go. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So Postman is is pretty important, and I'm hoping you all got it to work. Um, I guess there's always nuances about different browsers and how to scroll. It is a little unintuitive over here. You've got one scroll bar on the right and one scroll bar here. I know in my documentation before I've, I've had multiple scroll bars and people are like, don't do that. And I was like, eh, people figured out. No, it's actually unintuitive to have multiple things like this. So that is one issue. But anyway, uh, now, that we asked for imperial measurement that they gave us the barometric pressure in millibars. Oh, really? <laughs> the they have, they're confused about what imperial what, is. What should be the imperial unit for barome barometric pressure? Inches of mercury. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody knows, knows this stuff, all right. All right, now I want you to save the request. Um, over here on the right, <clears throat> you've got a save button. And by the way, this is the next little activity here in case you get lost. This is, uh, oh, no, I guess this is an extension of this existing one. Click Save, and now it says, what do you want to call it? I'm going to call this my Rally uh, Request, or basic. And you can describe it, whatever you want. Down here, scroll down a little bit, you'll see that there are collections. A collection is simply a folder to collect whatever requests you want to save there. Uh, I've already got a few created, but I'll create a new collection. I'll call it Raleigh, or maybe I should call it Carry Workshop. Then click the little green or orange check mark and select, select it. It's, it's not the most intuitive little thing there, but eventually the save button should become active. And it will appear here on the left in an expandable, collapsible way. You can see I've got a few other collections, Pass Workshop and other things. And now you can always return to it. Uh, pretty convenient. When you want to create a new one, you can just click the little tab and, and go to work. Or you can also do a Save As and use an existing request as a starting point for a new one. But now you can start to play around with it and say, all right, I've got my zip and my units. Let's, let's see what comes back without, without units uh, specified. Um, <clears throat> ah, this happened to one of another person too. The save button, the send button does disappear. That is odd. I wonder if this is a bug. Let me see if I... Yeah, well, if your send button disappears, just close it and then reopen it from the left. I don't know. But uh, if I send this guy without units, I can see that the, the temperature is now 286. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to figure out what unit that is. That's Kelvin. Kelvin? Yeah. Kelvin. Who, who was going to want the temperature in Kelvin? I thought that was a scientific Ask measurement. <laughs> Well, it's 286 Kelvin outside. You might not want to go out too, too quickly. That was a trivia question. No. All right. But uh, you can also, you know, um, I mean, typically in an API, you're going to have a lot of different parameters. 
<clears throat> and one of your jobs will be to test all the different parameters. So you could make extensive things here where you try them all, save them, and then see if uh, things change throughout the course of the API. All right, now another, we're done with Postman. Any final questions on Postman? Another way to submit requests is through something called curl or curl. It's a command line way of uh, submitting requests and getting responses. Um, this is something you do from your command line. Now curl it happens to be uh, way harder to make sure everybody's got, especially on Windows. Um, so if you don't have curl installed already, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, we're only having one short little activity here doing it. Uh, basically, curl, in addition to these, to the request URL shown here, right, there are these other commands on the left. See where it says dash x and then get, so forth, um, all after the word curl. Well, it turns out there are hundreds of different options for this. It's an extremely like powerful utility used for a lot of different things. Uh, these are probably the most common commands related to REST API requests. A dash I, this means to include the response headers, which we'll show here in a minute. A dash D, uh, this is if you're, if you're posting a request that has a body and you wanna include that request body, you would specify it after there. A dash H for a header and then the dash X specifies the method. Now we're gonna jump into, into uh, the methods and so forth and all this later, but this is just sort of an exposure to the different commands available in curl. And the response will be in JSON um, <clears throat> for most APIs or XML. But uh, just a little bit about JSON, if you've not worked with it much before. JSON is Anytime you have curly braces, that's going to be a JSON object. The two main types of things in a JSON response are an object and an array. An object is anything inside of curly braces, and these are usually key value pairs. You submitted a key value pair with that app ID where you had a, a key and then a value, right? Um, an array is a list of something, and that appears inside brackets, square brackets, and often a JSON response will mix these two up. You could have an object that contains arrays. You could have an array that contains objects. You know, it can be very confusing, actually, um, <clears throat> sorting it all out. And they have different levels of nesting. An object that contains another object that contains another object, you know, that contains an array. And developers have to figure out, okay, if the, if the information I want is buried at that third level in the array, how do I pull it out into my application? <clears throat> All right, so I want you to make a request with curl. This is activity 2D. And the way you'll do this, you'll actually transition from Postman to do this. <clears throat> so I told you Postman has this cool little code snippet part. Underneath the send button, there's a little very subtle link that says code. I don't know why they made it so subtle. It's one of the coolest features of Postman. If you click it, there, there's a dialog box that appears that says generate code snippets. This allows you to make the request, uh, to choose a language for making the request. Right? Postman, we don't really know exactly how it's submitting things. It's probably using curl in the back end. But, um, you can make the request in all these different languages. For example, in Java, if you were to make a web, a web request, or Go, let me, I don't know why Java wasn't working. If I choose Go, you can see that this is the language that, or this is a function that you'd use, you would use in Go in order to make a web request. And if I had a Go application, I could plug this in and, and it would be easier for me. Choose curl from here. C U R L. <clears throat> Some people they spell it differently. I think officially it is lower C and then URL, but I see it as all lowercase more commonly. And just to confuse things, there's also another application called curl that has nothing to do with this this C U R L. But anyway, copy the sample there. And 
Uh, I'm pretty sure you need to remove the postman header tokens. I'm not sure. Let me see. Yeah, they add some of its own little. Let's see if it if it works without it. Okay, so you've copied the curl command from here. Um, now there are a couple of gotchas already. So how many people are on Windows? Like half of everybody. Okay. Okay, I think, yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, Windows is going to require some manipulation. So open up a text editor, paste it in there. Well, actually, do before before you even do this, just go ahead and try it wholesale without without modifying it. Open up a command line terminal. If you're on a Mac, to open terminal, you're gonna it's the easiest way to find it is command space bar and then terminal. Just type it, and it should open up. If you're on Windows, depends which version, but I believe you go to the Start menu, type CMD, and then it should open up. In order to paste it in Windows, you're going to have to right click and choose Paste. Good morning. Hey, good morning. <laughs> is that is that Cortana? No, that's Siri. Oh, Siri. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to paste this here, and I get a response. Actually, uh, it's minified here in curl. Um, in Windows, try pasting it, and you should probably get an error for two reasons. You get an error? Yeah. Okay. Windows doesn't like two things. They don't like backslashes, and they don't like single quotes. <laughs> and you know what? You don't need this, these Postman headers. So paste in your curl sample in Notepad or something, and you can just remove these two lines that say dash H. And then remove these backslashes. I guess there's just one now. One of the first line, too. Um, oh, yeah, thanks. And then um, I believe change the single quotes to double. Copy this guy and try, try that. Uh, didn't like that. See if it doesn't like multiple lines. Might have to put everything on one line. You got it? Did you put everything on one line? It was already on one line. Okay. The backslashes I thought introduced line breaks into it. So there we go. Yeah. All right. Now, if you if you're on Windows and you didn't install curl ahead of time, um, I can show you how to install it. But I don't want to walk through it because this is like a nightmare installing things because different machines have different permissions sometimes. But um, how many of you were able to submit a curl response and get a res curl request and get a response? So only about half. All right. I'm not sure over all your edits. I got lost. Okay. Let me let me take a few steps back. Postman adds a couple of header values that are unnecessary. So just to reduce the complexity, delete these dash h, and then Windows doesn't like. Backslashes, these are added for readability to, to put the parameters on different lines. Delete those. There's one down there and one up here. But now you've got the problem that you've got multiple lines, so it's not going to read it. So now take and put everything on one line. And then convert the single apostrophes to double. You might ask, well, why didn't they just format it in a way that is copy and pasteable for both Windows and Mac? And that is a good question. There's, there's no reason. I mean, people want readability, so they do the slashes, right? And they probably forget that Windows machines uh, chokes on that. It must be Mac bigots. Yeah, yeah. It's just the Mac, the Mac brainwashed Mac people, blind to anybody else. It's like, oh, you have a Windows, you know, ah, don't Not even talk problems. to me. <laughs> I actually, um, I used to be really enamored of Macs, and then I got the latest, like 2017, or not the latest, the 2017 Mac, and I think it's um, a step down from the previous version. <laughs> Their butterfly keyboard, one crumb kills it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, so, should anybody need help? You want me to see if I can troubleshoot anything on the spot? What do we got? Even at the single line thing. Do you have curl installed? Well, if you just type curl, what happens? I don't think so. 
Yeah, so it's, yeah, you, you got to install curl. Yeah. If, if you just type the word curl, you might not have it installed correctly, or if you did install it, maybe you have to close your terminal session and start a new one. <coughs> but um, if you're trying to install curl, uh, I've got, let's see. I've got instructions on how to do it. Probably won't go through it, but I'll just point you to it right here. If you expand using an API like a developer, curl intro and installation, there's a handy link that has a nice installer. Install curl on Windows. There's a, a download page here. This is the easiest way to install curl I've found. And there's uh, different options. <coughs> I would choose either 32-bit or 64-bit and with administrator privileges, the free version. People in the past have been like, hey, I bought this. I'm like, no, don't buy anything here. Just install the free version. And it tends to work out that well, work out all right. Confused by code, curl, downloads, so. And I did like that you, on your page, you had ways to test it, because when I installed oh. it, I wasn't sure if I installed it properly. Okay. I looked there and, and was able to do the curl dash V and okay. see that I had installed it. What was it, curl dash V? I forgot. Uh, Yeah, curl dash capital V. So if you're if you're getting an error, type that and see if you've got curl installed. <laughs> Having done this workshop a number of times, I've realized that even this, some of these things that I thought in the beginning were simple can turn out to be quite complex if people you know don't have it installed right or all the different varieties of machines and permissions on the machines <laughs> and versions of the machines. Um, so I, w I don't want to spend time troubleshooting this because that's really the only activity we have right there with the curl. But uh, anybody else having issues that they are experiencing? Just keep in mind the Windows, it likes double quotes, doesn't like backslashes. And you have to right click to paste. There are other shells or, ter or terminal kind of things on a Mac. I really like something called iTerm because it gives me tabs. I can have multiple sessions and I feel like it just works better. Uh, you can load a bunch of defaults in something called a bash profile. Um, there's also like a git bash for Windows as well that gives you a very similar terminal. So I'll talk more about this in the publishing section, but you don't have to use the default Windows command line. Um, you can basically install git bash for Windows. Bash is like the, the language used in, in, uh, in command line. Um, and then you can use like your Unix commands where you can navigate up and down directories and so forth. Anyway, it's just kind of an aside, not really the main point here. Main point was to make a request with curl. Why did I go over curl? Well, you will probably find that your, your QA people are going to use curl because they can take and string up a lot of different requests into a script and run the script. Let's say you had 100 different requests, they want to test every permutation of the parameter and just go through it in a script that automates as part of their testing. Well, you can't really do that with Postman. I mean, how would, it's more of a, <clears throat> a thing you have to manually configure, right? But with curl, you can, you can script your requests and execute them as part of testing packages. And so uh, you'll see testers getting more geeky with them. Um, I had one tester guy who, who had all these groovy scripts and he had like 200 curl commands and it was like he was so proud about how it all just like pumped through all these different use cases and I was like oh, okay that's cool I just want one <laughs> <laughs> okay well, in fairness the people we're writing for yeah want to be scripting or yes coding. they don't want to be <clears throat> entering API commands manually you're right now um, in a lot of documentation, they will show curl as the default way of doing a request just because it's sort of language agnostic. When people code their web apps, they'll use Java or, or some other language, React. And, and each of those languages, you know, as I showed here, is going to have a different way of calling, making a request. You know, if you've got a PHP app. You know, I downloaded the latest version of Postman thinking I'd get the latest and greatest, and instead I get a buggy experience. Anyway, uh, let's say they have Ruby. It's going to look like this, right? So 
curl is sort of this uh, language agnostic way of showing the different parameters being passed to a request. You can't really show it with Postman. I mean, what would you do? Put a screenshot and say, you know, uh, populate parameters here. So yeah, curl is a great way to, to demo the request. We'll get into that later as, as we talk about the different components of a REST API reference topic and the requests and so forth. All right, um, now we have one more activity here. Let me see where I'm going. All right, it's very common uh, when you're when you're creating calls and requests with a with a web page or web application to sort of log the response to the console. Right now, we were just showing the log in Postman. Remember, we scrolled down here and we saw the, the response coming down in this really somewhat difficult to access part. Uh, or we showed the minified response in curl. But you can also use your browser and see what kind of information is coming back. And uh, when people put a little command in their, in their code that says console.log, it will, it will put it down there. I've got a sample page here. If you open up, I think this is, I think I have an activity coming up for this. Let me just show it real quick. But if you open up the developer console in Chrome, Firefox is similar. View developer JavaScript console. Uh, <clears throat> you can see here, I don't know why I'm getting some, oh. I need to probably shut off a Mozbar extension. Anyway, disregard this other <laughs> other stuff. Uh, this, this first little packet shows the same response. I've got, you don't see anything on the page, uh, but if you were to look and see, there's a request being made. We just haven't done anything with the information here. <clears throat> we're going to take a break here in like five minutes, just in case people are getting antsy for, for stuff. Uh, we're almost done with this section. But uh, you log something to the console, and then you can sort of expand and, and collapse it here. <coughs> if, you, if you try to find that wind, you'll see it's under main, or maybe not. Uh, it's under something. There we go, wind. Maybe it's its own first level person. And the developer could then use any of this information that's coming back. You can, you can see here we don't have a tremendous amount of information. You know, it's, if, if this were hundreds of lines long, it might take a while to load and have to iterate through. But it's fairly short. And, and now, the question for a developer is, how do I access this stuff in my code? And it depends which language the person is using. If they're using JavaScript, well, there's something called dot notation. Uh, uh, Java, er, JSON actually is, is part of JavaScript. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And if I wanted to get temperature, which might be an object inside main, which is an object inside response, you use little dots like this in your JavaScript code. And then that will access that value at that level. We're not going to dive into this too much because it's sort of getting too far into the JavaScript details, which may or may not be relevant. But this is how a developer would work with the content. They would use probably JavaScript object notation. Your front end developers would pull out what they want, and um, the result would be uh, something like this, where you now you've, you're making the request, you're getting the stuff, and there's just simple JavaScript to print that to the page. To kind of have fun and test your skills here, the last activity in this section is to make an AJAX request and inspect the payload, right? So now, follow along with me to the workshop page. You'll definitely need to go through here. This is the last activity. <clears throat> so, I'll try to walk through this together. You're gonna, you're, gonna make a, you're gonna create a simple HTML page that has a request to this endpoint, and you're gonna log the request to the console. Start with this boilerplate HTML, copy it, into a text file uh, using whatever text editor you, you prefer, Sublime Text, whatever. Um, I'm just going to call this sample page.html. 
save it on my desktop where I know it, where it is. Okay. The only unique thing about this boilerplate code is that it's got a it's got a script resource for jQuery, which means um, I can use jQuery. Uh, jQuery is a an easier way to use JavaScript. It just simplifies some things. It's basically on almost every website. So, uh, step two: save the file, whatever you want to call it. All right. Step three: you're going to open Postman. Click that little code button on the right, the code link that appears under the save button. Look for JavaScript. Oh man. And it would not, oh. You have to click it. Am I not, am I just not understanding their UI? How come I can't open this guy? It works on Windows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does this button work on any Mac people, machines? Okay. See jQuery Ajax and Exception XR. Does it matter what we need? Um, you scroll, you scroll bar in the bottom. Oh, yeah, you have a scroll bar in your bottom. Oh. You do it. Oh. Huh. Scroll it halfway. Wow. I didn't think I'd be the one with technical issues. Okay. If you're on a Mac, instead, you can just copy it from, from here. Fortunately, I have a backup. <laughs> this is what it should look like, this little snippet of code, all right? Var settings and then this little Ajax function. This Ajax function is a method in jQuery that lets you submit requests and get response. And see how setting, sorry, it's probably really small here. See how settings is a passed in as a parameter to this method? Well, settings is defined here, and if you look and read the a Ajax documentation, it will say, Settings accepts such and such uh, uh, properties here, and one of them is the URL, and this happens to be where we're requesting things. Well, just go ahead and copy that either from my web page or <coughs> um, from Postman, and you're going to add this as uh, <coughs> right in some script tags below the existing script tag. So if I go back into my application here, all right, I'm going to I'm going to add a pair of script tags like that. Oh, uh, and then I'm going to paste what I just had in between them. This is anytime you have JavaScript, you have to put it inside of script tags on a web page, and that's all we're doing here. All right. Uh, Okay, so that is pretty much the extent of it. Now, the only other thing is that Postman, I remember, told you insert some headers, which again, I don't fully understand why they do this, but they screw up the code. So look for this headers object right here that I have highlighted and, and remove it. This is cache control Postman token. You gotta remove that and the comma before it, otherwise the, uh, the comma after get, otherwise it'll be invalid. Right. So your final code should look like this, where you've got you've got the script tags below here with the little code that has the Ajax method. And I think it's just going to use my API key that I've already populated here. Um, all right. Save your file. Open up a new tab in, in Chrome. Go. Commando, or however you open a file, find your file, open it, and it should be completely blank on the surface. Then open up the JavaScript console by going to View Developer JavaScript Console, and you should see an object logged there. This is the, the request and the information there. All right? That is, that is the extent of this activity, if you're able to get that. I'll give you guys a few minutes and, and raise your hand if you if you're stuck. You want me to come try to troubleshoot some, something on the fly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how many people were able to successfully see the object logged in their JavaScript console? Raise your hand. Wow, we're hitting it like forty <laughs> percent. All right. Where are you guys getting stuck? Who's? I think 
in the Chrome browser and Windows, it's like a little different. You don't have the view. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Somebody was just asking about that. So, if you're in if you're in Chrome, you can also open Developer Tools. Like if you. Do, a lot of people don't have this menu up here. And to be honest, I'm not really sure why this appears and doesn't appear. If you don't have it, uh, maybe you have a little menu over here where it says more tools. And it also says developer tools. See this? If you open up developer tools, it's the same thing. You just have to click console. It doesn't go immediately to it. All right, so, so if you don't have that menu up there, more tools. Developer tools. And then to open a file, that's also somewhat unintuitive. I find Command or Control O is just the easiest way. Okay, uh, we're going to take, well, yeah, why don't we take a 10 minute break? And I'll, during the break, I'll help people too. But uh, come back at 10 20 and, and we'll hit the next section. All right? <laughs>